So now, <clears throat> Fred Sanders came to my attention because a good friend, a vicar in Hull, England, named Melvin Tinker, sent me an email with a YouTube link that said, have you ever seen this guy speak? He's got sound theology, he's a fascinating speaker, and I think you should figure out where he lives and works and get a hold of him and have him come lecture at the library. And I thought, this is great, and I started researching him. And I found out he not only has written countless books, but he's written comic books <laughs> about the Trinity. Would you join me in giving a Texas welcome to Dr. Fred Sanders? Thank you very much. It's really good to be here. This is my first trip to the Lanier Theological Library, and I'm just really impressed. It's a great space to be speaking to you in. I'm going to be lecturing tonight, and it's going to be kind of academic, but I really want to invite you to an act of intellectual worship. And I don't mean to pat you on the back and say, oh, this is special intellectual worship. What I'm saying is you can worship God with the mind, and the doctrine of the Trinity in particular is a great piece of Christian theological heritage that summons us to lift up the mind. In some worship traditions, we're exhorted to lift up the heart. Um, and also in, in theology, if you do it right, some theology can be dry, dull, boring, and uninspiring, but theology can also be an act of worship. And that's what I'd like to invite you to join me in tonight. I want to talk about seeing the Trinity in Scripture. I want to talk about the triune God revealed in the Bible and how to see that God in Scripture. Now, seeing is a metaphor. Um, it, what I mean by seeing is, instead of just receiving the doctrine of the, of the Trinity from tradition and thinking, I believe this because wiser, older Christians, many of them centuries past, authorized this and endorse it, and so I take it on credit that, yeah, we should believe that. It's probably in there somewhere. But then if someone were to ask you, where exactly in Scripture is the doctrine of the Trinity? If you sort of hem and haw at that point and gesture broadly at the whole book and say, you know, sort of like Prego spaghetti sauce, it's in there, right? <laughs> but you can't actually turn to any particular section and say, let me show you how you can be a good Berean, check for yourself, and actually open the Bible and see the doctrine of the Trinity. That's what I'm after tonight. Um, I'm grateful for the Christian tradition. I love the centuries of theological uh, care and precision that have gone into honing and refining and stating and teaching the doctrine of the Trinity. But I think it's really crucial that we recognize that it, we believe in the Trinity because we believe it's revealed in Scripture. Even if we wanted to do a little study on the church fathers, which I won't be doing tonight, I'll be doing kind of a sola scriptura thing here, uh, but even if we were to study the church fathers, what they would teach us is, we got this from the Trinity. Or, sorry, they did get it from the Trinity. What I meant to say was they got it from the Bible. And it's no compliment to the church fathers to say, we believe the Trinity because they believe the Trinity. They would smack your hand and say, no, no, no. This is not the right amount of authority to form your doctrine of who God is. The only way we know who God is is because how he's revealed himself, especially in the witness of Scripture. So, seeing is a metaphor here, but it's an important one. I'm also going to literally show you pictures of the Trinity, kind of. You ready to see those? Um, this is a little portable altar from about 1160 uh, from Germany, uh, Cologne or Köln. And the artist is Albertus, Albertus of Cologne. It's a little portable altar. You would carry sort of holy objects in it to, to set up, uh, uh, to move it around the church so it's not a stationary altar. It's enamel work. So you got a lot of metal work here, gold and precious uh, stones and metals, um, and, and then baked on enamel. And that's why um, after all these centuries, it's still sharp and bright, and it just looks like a little jewel box. I'm gonna do a close-up here on the cover, the lid of it. This is the lid of this little portable altar in Cologne. I went all the way to Cologne a couple years ago hoping to see this, and it wasn't on display. Like, I finally managed to find my way to the right museum, and sorry, it's in the storage room right now. Oh, well. Um, maybe next time. Um, <laughs> What you can see across the top and the bottom bands are the 12 apostles. They're labeled apostles of the Lord. And I just want to show you briefly what's going on on the right. That's not what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on what's on the left over there, which is about the Trinity. Um, but on the right, I just want to show you how systematic Albertus of Cologne is in thinking about um, imagery 
from Scripture. So he's teaching about the resurrection of Jesus. And here you have the image of the resurrection. These are the three women coming to the tomb here in the um, uh, kind of styled as a marble sarcophagus. And the angels there pointing to the empty tomb saying, he's not there. And uh, the soldiers are, are passed out asleep. Uh, so that's the empty tomb. Uh, important part of resurrection theology, the witness that he is not there in the tomb, that they went to see where the body should be and the body had got up and gone away. Then here's one of the resurrection appearances. You could pick many of the appearances of the risen Lord to his disciples, um, but what this artist picked is the appearance to Mary Magdalene, where Jesus is making that curious gesture, don't cling to me, don't touch me, I have not yet ascended. And then at the top you have the ascension of the Lord where Jesus is rising up into heaven and his disciples are watching him go. The artist couldn't have him go very far up or you'd have to have a bigger panel, right? Um, but there's just enough here to indicate he is ascending. And I show you this just to show you the way this artist is good at juxtaposing key scenes from the Bible, right? So you have a whole robust theology here presented visually of the resurrection and the presence of the risen Lord and the ascension of the risen Lord. And it's all sort of there. It would take quite a while to teach through that um, in, a, in a series of studies, but Albertus gets it all there for you. Well, that brings us to the other side, where in the center you have an easily recognizable image of the crucifixion. Christ on a cross, um, on one side is Mary, his mother, on the other side, John the evangelist, above the sun and the moon weeping, and below him, um, the blood from the cross is flowing down into the open sarcophagus of Adam. You can see him labeled there to his right uh, in Latin, but fortunately Adam in Latin is Adam. So, <laughs> so we can read that. Above that, um, abbreviated uh, Latin, Passion of Christ, Passio Christi. Um, Adam here is being given life by the death of the second Adam. And, and lest you think I'm overinterpreting this, look at the rectilinear forms, look at the sort of rectangular solids behind him. Um, just as Christ is on this geometric green cross, Adam happens to be raising his hands in this life is coming to me uh, gesture, which also kind of makes him um, imitate the form of Jesus on the cross. It's a very strong first Adam, second Adam thing going on here. This is the kind of thinker Albertus of Cologne is as he tries to picture the Trinity. All that is just to get us ready for the top of the cross here where the dove of the Holy Spirit is ascending. I think it's a reference to the words of Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. But it's also a deeper reflection on the unity of the Father and the Son in the very act of the death of Christ on the cross, um, that they are not divided or split off, the Trinity didn't break up for the weekend, God didn't come apart, but that the Father and the Son and the unity of the Spirit are working out our salvation up in the top in the little semicircle indicating that this is sort of a visionary um, um, indication of what's going on in heaven, you have God the Father, but because this artist knows you can't really draw God the Father, he's probably thinking, remember when the disciples asked Jesus, will you show us the Father? And, and Jesus' answer was, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So this artist, kind of playing it safe, decides to just paint Jesus right down to the cross and the halo, which is you know, a definite indicator of Jesus. Um, but I know it's supposed to be the Father because written on either side of the dove, you see the Latin word Trinitas. So this artist took the image of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, placed it in the context of the presence of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in that same work of salvation, and said, this is the presentation of the Trinity involved in salvation. This image, which iconographers and art historians call the throne of grace uh, icon of the Trinity, um, it was invented somewhere around this time, somewhere in the 1100s in France or Germany. This is an early instance of it, and it's labeled. You know, very, very strange, unusual in art history to have an artifact that has labels cooked right into the enamel. So you don't have to guess, you have to go, I know he was thinking Trinity. How do I know? It says Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was very popular during the plague. Uh, I can't go into all the details here, but the throne of grace image of the Trinity was um, put on banners and carried through towns um, stricken by the great plague. Um, if, and if you think about that, what do you see? If you see Jesus on the cross while you're suffering with a mortal illness, you might think, that guy is suffering with me. Life is very bad. But if you just see God on the throne, you might think, I am suffering terribly, but God is on the throne, but that's a long way away from here. But if you see Jesus on the cross with the sovereign God behind him, you think, that's got everything, right? 
That's got God safely above and blessed in the high holiness of the triune being, firmly established on high. And it's got Jesus in his human nature really truly down here in, uh, in and among the suffering that we're going on. Uh, and especially undergoing the greatest of sufferings for our real problem, which is not um, illnesses, but sin. So would you give us a presentation of the gospel and then a reflection on the deep background of the gospel, which is the triune God. That if this Christian salvation thing is gonna work at all, it's gonna work because God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we turn to try to find where we can see the doctrine of the Trinity in scripture, one thing we're gonna notice is it's really linked to the gospel. Trinity and gospel always go together. Even in terms of the clarity of the revelation of the Trinity, that's not there in, the clarity's not there in the Old Testament, right? It really becomes clear in the New Testament. Um, but you could also say that about the gospel. The gospel is predicted, promised, prophesied, uh, foreshadowed, prefigured. Clearly the Old Testament is pointing forward to this fulfillment of salvation that's gonna happen. It's when the new covenant comes, when, when Jesus and the Holy Spirit arrive, that both the gospel is uh, unveiled and revealed in its fullness, and the triune nature of God is unveiled and revealed in its fullness. So Trinity and gospel are bundled. Um, that happens to be my life message and the main thing I say everywhere I go all the time. It's also the background for how I'm gonna show you how to see the Trinity in the Bible. So let's get straight to the Bible, uh, or at least a little image of it there. Uh, it's an open Bible. It should be a little more open. I'm gonna talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament in dialogue. I am well aware that the Old Testament is, as my Old Testament scholar best friend tells me, most of the Bible, right? Every now and then I'll mention doing a biblical theology of something, and it's really just a New Testament theology. And my Old Testament scholar friend Joe will say, that's good, but you forgot most of the Bible. <laughs> right, right, I should include most of the Bible. So I am gonna talk here at the beginning about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I just couldn't find a good picture of a Bible open mostly to the Old Testament. We should be like either looking at the last page of Malachi or the first page of Matthew or maybe the blank page in between them, yeah. Um, but here's the thing, what happens right there in the middle of the Bible in the sense of right between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Father sends the Son and the Spirit. This is my plot summary for the Bible. This is the main thing that happens. And um, that is the, the, well, I'll get that in a minute. Sorry, got a little excited there. Okay. Um, the interesting thing that happens here is the Father sends the Son, that is the incarnate Son, Jesus Christ, and pours out the Spirit, that is the Spirit who arrives in this epochal way at Pentecost on the basis of the finished work of Christ. The Father sends them um, between the writing of the Old Testament and the writing of the New Testament. Yeah? I want you to picture here, um, I'm going to talk about what's in the Bible, but for a minute step back from the Bible and think about when Jesus and the Spirit came. Uh, they came and then later the writings of the apostles were about them. You see the move I'm making here? I got it from B.B. Warfield, a classic essay he wrote about 100 years ago where um, they were editing the, um, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, great reference work. James Orr was editing it and he said, who should I get to write the Trinity article for the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia? And he figured, B.B. Warfield, Princeton Seminary, let's get that guy. So Warfield agrees to write it, and here's how he starts. The doctrine of the Trinity is not yet revealed in the Old Testament, if we mean clearly revealed, right? There are shadows, there are indications, but if you're talking about actual revelation, it is not yet made known under the conditions of the Old Covenant um, in the writings of the Old Testament. Um, we can look back later with light borrowed from the coming of Christ in the Spirit and see many things there. But it's not yet there in the Old Testament. Fairly uncontroversial, you might wanna pick a fight with that and bring up your favorite Old Testament Trinity adumbrations and say, what about that, B.B. Warfield? Uh, but it's pretty uncontroversial to say the Trinity's not yet made known in the Old Testament. The next move he makes is to say, the doctrine of the Trinity is also not revealed in the New Testament. Because by the New Testament, the Son and the Spirit have already arrived, made known the triune nature of God, and now documents are being written about them by apostles in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Old Testament's too soon for the revelation of the Trinity. The New Testament's too late for the revelation of the Trinity. And so now I'm gonna fill up the next 10,000 words writing my article about the Trinity for the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia 
by saying the Trinity is not revealed in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Right? It's actually revealed between the Testaments. Now this is gutsy, and you'd have to be B.B. Warfield to try to pull this off, right? Um, by between the Testaments, of course, he does not mean intertestamental literature. He does not mean that one blank page they put in your Bible between Malachi and Matthew. He means in the actual historical arrival of the Son and the Spirit. So that, what's the first voice you hear in the New Testament? Maybe 1 Thessalonians? By that time, Paul is already saying, you know, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You know, that stuff we talked about. You know, that stuff that already happened. Um, Warfield, in the rest of that essay, and I commend it to you, um, in the rest of that essay, he then makes much of the fact that in the New Testament, Paul never stops and says, now concerning the triune nature of God, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. There's no point at which Paul thinks that he is establishing for the first time in writing and in teaching the doctrine of the Trinity. He presupposes it. The apostles are all writing with a confident, robust grasp of the fact that the one God is Father and Son and Spirit. Um, this explains a lot. It takes uh, passages in the New Testament that you wish were more explicit about the Trinity, and it recasts them because you say, oh right, they are indirectly referring to a reality that they all are aware of in the very act of being the church, of being saved by Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine is already sort of there, and at no point do they have to establish it. Well, the Old Testament then is the time of promise, and the New Testament is the time of fulfillment. And if we look a little bit closer at that, uh, the Old Testament, uh, in its forward look at salvation, is saying that the Messiah and the Spirit are coming. You can kind of bundle the one who is the Messiah with the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Both are apocalyptic expectations, right? In that final age, the Messiah will come. The Spirit will be poured out. Messiah means the one who is anointed, right? And specifically, uh, we can talk about the anointing with the Holy Spirit. By the time of the New Testament, according to Warfield, you've got authors saying, hey, the Messiah and the Spirit already came. So the revelation of the Trinity, if we're being careful with the word revelation, happens between the Testaments. Well, um, this is my best attempt to make a drawing of the God of the Old Testament for you. Um, it was, I figured if I was gonna do something that cheeky, I should do it badly, so nobody like, made the mistake of thinking I'd done a good job at it. So kind of a learned ignorance here. What I wanna point out here is something about the relationship between the Old and the New Testament. We already looked at one thing, the fact that the central event of salvation history, maybe this is a better way to say it, the central event of salvation history for Christians is not the arrival of a book with truth in it. That might be a fair statement for the central event in say Mormon history or maybe even Muslim history. But in Christianity, we have a book, it's a really great book, it's inerrant, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's the trustworthy guide. But the arrival of the book was not the main thing, and we didn't wait for the book to have the central truth shown to us. Jesus and the Spirit are the main thing. In the Old Testament, um, I want to point to another thing going on here between the Testaments. There is a, there is a brightness and a, and a blurriness and a wildness um, to the, the manifestations of God in the Old Testament that um, I think characterize all of the language throughout the entire volume. Um, and here's especially what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking about when God describes himself and uses that kind of reflexive language. And instead of saying something very straightforward in the first person, like I am this, I am that, I am the other thing, God will say things like, I will turn my face toward you. Now you might just say, oh, well that's a quaint Hebrew way of saying it. Yes, it is. I also think there's some real theological content there. When God turns his face to you, has God turned toward you? Yes, he turned his face toward you. So his face is God, and yet it's the face of God, right? Now we get used to it. If, you, if you're used to reading the Old Testament, you get used to this pretty easily. But imagine if I uh, came up here and said, uh, thank you for coming into my presence as I turn my face toward you. It's true you came into my presence and I turned my face toward you. It's just a really bizarre way for me to talk, right? What do I say? I'm glad to be here, good to see you, right? One of the reasons I do that is I'm not God. Um, the other reason is um, I think God is communicating something about um, an attribute or a poetic way of describing his presence with his people or a way that God self-describes his action for his people. It always has these sorts of features to it. Like the name of God sometimes functions as God. 
Not in an idolatrous way, obviously, but I think about um, poor old Moses when he is commissioned to do a very hard job and is bold enough to lay down some rules and say, I'm not going unless you go with me. I'm not going unless you go with me. To which God replies, I will send my angel and I will put my name in him. And if I'm Moses, I'm probably feeling antsy about already having set conditions, but I'm really thinking, what? You'll send your angel and put your name in him. Is that, was that a yes or a no? Because I made it really clear I'm not going unless you go with me, but you're sending your angel, your messenger, and, but not just any old messenger, a messenger with your name in him. I think that means you're going with me, right? And we can assume that because Moses goes and God is with him. Um, these things are all over. Uh, you know, time would fail me to go through the examples. Some of the others in the Old Testament are the law of God, the hand of God. Um, instead of God just saying, I will do that, he, will, he says he'll stretch forth his hand and do it. The wisdom of God, of course, uh, takes on um, these attributes and is, is somehow God and yet is of God, is from God, is the wisdom of God. Uh, the glory of God and its indwelling especially functions in this way. The word of God and the spirit of God are numbered among these. And if we were to just go through these, if I were to tell you, guess what? In the one God, there's more than one person. Look around in the Old Testament and see if you could find him. If you were to do that, by the way, don't do it. Um, you might kind of go through here and say, well, there's at least nine persons. Because I think word is somebody, spirit is somebody, glory is somebody, name is somebody, wisdom is somebody. Yet it's all one God somehow. But there's like, I don't know, 27 persons in this. I do not know how to say 27, the 27 version of Trinity. But it's just as well, because we shouldn't say it anyway. Because we're not in that kind of business, right? We're not looking into God's ways of speaking and manifesting himself and deciding which of those are persons. That would be kind of hopeless. What really happens is the incarnation and Pentecost. Christ comes and the Holy Spirit comes. And based on that very concrete experienced reality of God manifesting himself personally in space and time and history, then those people read their Bible, which of course is the Old Testament, right? Most of the Bible and the only Bible the apostles were using. They go back and read that and do a Bible study. Jesus explains things to them on the road to Emmaus. And they say, oh, that thing where you said you were gonna, God said he's gonna send forth his word, that was you, right? And similarly, they go through and say, so it also seems like this, in this passage, the hand of God is kind of about Jesus. But in this passage, and this is where it gets kind of fun, some of these seem to be representations of an Old Testament pneumatology, that the, the person who concretely shows up at Pentecost, you can look back and say, oh, that was always how God dwelt in the temple in his glory. That, all of that was the person we give the New Testament name Holy Spirit to. Um, John makes it easy for us, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. And you're no longer guessing and trying to pick how many persons there are in God. There are really only three candidates. You think about this for a few generations and you say, so it seems like God has not changed. God has made something more specific and concrete known about himself. And in light of that, we can retrospectively go back and identify throughout the entire Bible, the Son and the Spirit. Now, don't memorize this chart. I put those things up there crooked on purpose because I'm not sure which way they go. There's some fascinating discussions in the second century where people like Irenaeus are trying to decide, is wisdom a word for your doctrine of Christ or is wisdom a word for your doctrine of the Holy Spirit? Discuss amongst yourselves, right? Basically, I'm not sure there's one right answer there. There's clearly some wisdom Christology going on from Proverbs. There's clearly some wisdom pneumatology going on from some other areas. So I don't, I'm not hard and fast about this, but what I'm saying is, we can be absolutely certain about the coming of the Son and the coming of the Spirit. And so sometimes people ask the simple question, why aren't there more than three persons in the Trinity? And the main answer is, I don't know. Um, except the answer from the Bible is, there are really no other candidates, right? Like we're not, we're not looking around going, I wonder if that person's part of God. Um, in light of this, I added the word Father last because there's a sense in which God, the one God, the maker of heaven and earth, um, is not clearly revealed as Father until the Son of God is revealed, right? It, you might kind of, there's a kind of a common sense way of thinking. First we had the Father, then the Father sent the Son. But you don't have the Father without the Son. You just have God. At best in the Old Testament, you have metaphorically the Father in that God brought us all forth and there's a way in which our Creator is our Maker, but it's analogical, right? Um, uh, whereas in the New Testament, 
we get the revelation that Father is the name of God and Son is also the name of God and these are relational and they go together. Now I did it really quick for you there with visuals. Um, it took a few centuries to get clear about that. But in those centuries of getting clear, no new information was added. It really was just pondering the apocal nature of the difference between what was made known about God under the old covenant and what is made known about God under the new covenant. Well, um, here's just a little, uh, a little picture I took from a German children's Bible from uh, the 20th century. On the one side, you've got the ministry of Jesus Christ. On the other side, you've got um, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. I, I don't know, I like these images for a lot of reasons. One is the image on the right scares me to death because um, it, it doesn't really look like tongues of flame resting over each one's head. It looks like a meteor shower. <laughs> and, um, and the reason I focus on images like this um, is that you really want to think about, if you want to have very Trinitarian thoughts, you shouldn't draw a triangle and think, how can I get to the number three? That's not the key idea. The key idea is always, what is Christ doing and what is the Spirit doing as they are sent from the Father? If you've got a solid doctrine of Jesus Christ and a solid doctrine of the Holy Spirit, then they will both, within their, within their soundness, they will confess being from the Father. And they're not two unrelated missions. The mission of the Spirit and the mission, the mission of the Son and the mission of the Spirit are always together. Um, Irenaeus in the second century used the image of the two hands of God. It's a very rough image, um, but he says, God is always directly involved with us because the Father is never without his two hands the Son and the Spirit. Um, again, I use that one because I'm not afraid that anyone's gonna go home and think, so is God like this, like a guy in two hands? It's, um, it's a, an incomplete enough image that all it gets for you is the necessary two-handedness, or uh, I guess if I were inventing doctrines, I'd talk about the doctrine of the ambidextrity of the work of God. Yeah, but that would be, then you'd really be getting your money's worth. Okay. Um, well, that's the second thing about the relation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, is the clarity about the nature of God without contradicting or refuting or changing anything about the God that we knew. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David truly knew the true God. And in some of those cases, they were much closer to God than I am in terms of some dramatic experiences with God. But as a new covenant believer, I have to confess that I know more about the identity of God. It doesn't contradict what Old Testament saints believed, but it's more concrete. The next thing I wanna talk about in the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and by the way, I'm intentionally doing a big whole Bible fly over here before I get to a few specific verses um, in the later part of the talk, is that reading forward from the Old Testament, we have a clear expectation of a Messiah coming, that is a son of David who will rule in certain ways and in whom certain promises will be fulfilled and he'll be great David's greater son but by that I don't mean Solomon, I mean an even greater son uh, than great David. And so we're looking for that son. But we're also looking for a suffering servant uh, as we read through the theology of Isaiah. And of course there's a classic discussion in rabbinic Judaism about whether this could possibly be the same person or whether we're looking for the Messiah on the one hand and the servant on the other hand. Um, well, it's more complex than that because there are plenty of promises uh, where the Lord himself will come to his temple so there's a sense in which Old Testament expectation is not just waiting for the son of David to carry out certain promises, but to wait for God to show up, that the Lord himself will come. So this is this huge horizon of expectation. Um, and of course, Moses uh, promised that a prophet like him would arise and that we should listen to him. Um, and we're also looking for eschatological things, end times things like the pouring out of the spirit on all flesh as prophesied in Joel 2. Well, it's easy to do an Old Testament Bible study and come out looking for, say, seven or eight different things to come. You're looking at the future from the Old Testament thinking, this is gonna be a busy, kind of crowded zone of fulfillment where a lot of things, you know, the Messiah is gonna come, the servant's gonna come, then the Lord's gonna show up, and all this is gonna happen. Of course, the interesting thing that happens in the New Testament is all that fulfillment converges on the single event of the Father sending the Son and the Holy Spirit. I call it, again, making up big words just for fun, I call it convergent hyper-fulfillment. <laughs> what seemed to be going a lot of directions, somehow, through some sort of mathematical calculation I can't do, actually turned out to be all converging, 
all converging on the revelation of the Trinity when the Father sends the Son and the Holy Spirit to accomplish our salvation. Um, and I say hyper-fulfillment because it's not just that you add up all the things you're looking for and count the promises and look for their fulfillment, but something even greater happens. There is a, there is a revelation of God with us um, in the intimacy of God making himself known to us as Father, Son, and Spirit that I think in some cases exceeds Old Testament expectations. Uh, that's, that's a high claim for the doctrine of the Trinity, but, but I think it's an apostolic claim. Okay, last thing I want to say now about the relation of the Old and the New Testament and how that bears on our knowledge of God as Trinity is something I want to say in a picture. There, that's worth a thousand words, so I'll just skip this part of the lecture. Right? No, um, no um, you might recognize these guys. It's the two good spies who went into Canaan and did their reconnaissance in the Valley of Eshkol, and they came back. Of course, we're focusing on the sunny side here because 10 of the spies came back and said, that promised land is terrible. God's a bad promiser. I don't know what he was thinking. Those people are going to eat us up. Of course, God said, okay, one year in the wilderness for every day you were in the Valley of Eshkol. I'm actually going to bury all of you out there except Joshua and Caleb, uh, and your kids will inherit it. So I'm keeping my promises and punishing you, and it works out very tidily. But these two guys went into the promised land and came back and said, it's awesome. God is a good promiser. His ways are true. And I mean, the grapes there, the clusters are so big, it takes two guys to carry them. And so this is that. Now, this artist has taken a few liberties. One of them is the grapes are the size of watermelons. And I hasten to point out the Bible doesn't say the grapes were that big. It says the clusters were that big. So if you're trying to think, what do I have to believe to take the Bible literally? You don't have to believe in, in uh, you know, uh, grapes of that size. But still, it's pretty cool. Another liberty that this artist has taken is that the guy in front, he's having a fine time. He's a good spy. He's carrying the grapes out of the promised land. But the guy in back is chomping as he goes. <laughs> which, which is, that's just better, right? Like, they're both, they both, they're both under the blessing of the grapes, but the guy, it's better to be the guy in back, right? In which there is a mystery. This is a, a visual allegory of the relation of the old and the new covenants. It is the one blessing of God administered under two dispensations. Um, the one in front goes along first, and the fulfillment of the blessing comes along behind him after he's gone. The one in back comes along, the blessing has already happened and it's right there in front of him. He comes along after the fulfillment has occurred and that's better because you can see it. He still walks by faith in another sense, um, but the one in front really walks by faith in an old covenant sense. The one in back not only sees the fulfillment, but partakes of it during the journey. Yeah, That's the relation of the old and the new covenants. The, the God of the Bible is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that is made known less intimately, because, why? Because the gospel is not yet put into effect under the conditions of promise. Okay, well, that is the big picture. What I wanna do now for you is go through three key texts on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, I think it's really important to establish the big picture first, because I never wanna give the impression that the doctrine of the Trinity is assembled in a sort of here reverse there reverse fashion. Um, you'll always be frustrated if you think you're going to just pick through the Bible, pick out the right verses, scotch tape them together, and get the doctrine. Um, you can do that. I, I'd be glad to perform that event for you um, at any time. You know, I could give you diagrams. Uh, you can work your way around, prove the Son is God, prove the Father is God, prove they're not each other. That's a doable thing. Um, that's, not, that's not how we got to the doctrine of the Trinity. We got to the doctrine by reflecting on all of Scripture in a holistic way. Uh, that's, that's a big advantage. What that means is the Trinity is not one strange little doctrine we manage to put together if we work it just right. It's the central message, yeah? That, that's an advantage. Uh, it, it is to, to get the point of Scripture and then step back one step and say, okay, get the storyline of, uh, story of Scripture. What does this mean about who God is? When you ask that question, the Christian answer is it means God is Father, Son, and Spirit, one God in three persons. Nevertheless, we can experience it as a disadvantage because we can experience as, I like my doctrines verse-sized. I, I would like to, <laughs> when you ask me why I believe something, I would like to point to a chapter and verse and quote it to you like an Awana kid and just nail it, right? <laughs> I mean, proof texts are awesome. Um, I don't want to be in the position of like waving my hand at the whole Bible and saying like, you know, generally it's Trinitarian. Um, the doctrine of the Trinity really is too large to fit in one verse. We'll look at some golden passages here, but none of them lay out the entire doctrine of the Trinity 
all in one place. You do have to sort of gather in truth from all of scripture. And that's why I wanted to start with the big picture. Okay, the first verse I wanna look at is uh, the section, the text is John 1, 1 through 3. So the prologue of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. If I were more fluent in the iconography of this chapel, I could point to where these passages are for you um, in, in, our, in our surroundings. Here's something I wanna point out about this passage. It is talking about what was already true at Genesis 1, right? Obviously, John is referring back to another book that starts in the beginning. But what he wants to say is, in the beginning, there was already something going on in God. The word, the word already is not here in the text, but that's the sense. In the beginning, already was the word. You can think about this in terms of, well, here are the four evangelists up here in the dome. Um, you can think about this in terms of the question, how far back do you have to start the story of Jesus to get the story of Jesus right? In the beginning, right? But you can kind of see the gospel writers having a contest about this. Mark decides, well, you can't just say once upon a time was Jesus. You have to start with the baptism of John. No, in fact, you have to start with Isaiah, right? Saying, prepare the way. So that, that works. And then Matthew says, mm, I mean, Isaiah's great, but that's, you know, that's exilic. Uh, we gotta go back further than that. I'm not saying you're wrong, Mark. I'm just saying, what if we put in a genealogy and did this the right way and kind of went all the way back to Abraham, right? And Luke comes in and says, that's good, but if you're doing a genealogy, why don't you run that thing all the way back to Adam, right? Because Abraham, that's 12, that's Genesis 12, but uh, Adam, that, now we're getting back into the first chapters. And then John comes in and says, you guys aren't really getting this right, yeah? I mean, <laughs> if you really wanna say what was manifested when Jesus came, you're gonna have to go all the way back before Abraham, you're gonna have to go back before Adam, you're gonna go back before before there were befores. You're gonna have to go, you're gonna have to go back before the foundation of the world, which is this great New Testament phrase, which I don't think the Old Testament ever dares to say. It's the fact that you meet Jesus and say something's going on here that goes back before the foundation of the world. You go back before the foundation of the world, there's nowhere to put anything except in God. And that's where John puts him. The word was with God and the word was God. That was already going on. And then all the things were made through him. We could say this really quickly in little one-syllable words. The word was with God and the word was God. How can you be, how can you with something and was something at the same time? How can you have withness and wasness? You know, my name's Fred, my dad was Fred, my son's Fred. It's not at all like the Trinity. Because um, actually my granddad was Fred too, so that blows the whole thing. But if I had my son Fred here with me, I could say, Fred is with Fred. And you'd say, yes, that is clear. But then if I hugged him close and said, Fred is Fred. <laughs> You'd, you'd be worried about my parenting and like, <laughs> right, all kinds of, on the other hand, if I, if I put him aside and said, okay, Fred is Fred, and Fred is with Fred, then you'd think, now I'm also worried about you, because you you just are you, you're not with you, or if you bring your son in, you're just with them, you, 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 know, you don't was him, you know, but somehow, the relationship between God and his word is a relationship of both wasness and withness. This is what's fun and infuriating about reading John. He sets you puzzles like this all throughout, you know, uh, all throughout the gospel he does this. And he starts it right in these first lines. Simple little words, but you have to kind of say, on the one hand, there's withness, which is like relation and distinction. On the other hand, there's identity, which is just, you know, the verb to be in, in, the, in talking about God. So both of those are going on at the same time. Fundamental building block here of the doctrine of the Trinity. Keynote of the gospel of John clues you into how to read the meaning of the story that he then turns to tell, where Jesus talks about the Father and the Son constantly and then begins talking about the Spirit. Well, I'm showing you just the top part of a diagram here of um, the, uh, you might have seen this diagram of the Trinity, this shield that represents the logical relations between the terms in the Trinity. And it says, the Father is God, the Son is God, but the Father is not the Son. Um, this is just a bare bones logical kind of abstraction of what you have to have to have the two related to each other, they can't simply be each other, and yet they are both God, yeah? Um, I chopped off the Holy Spirit, I did that, because John did it, right? Um, the, the opening verses of the Gospel of John just want you to get this wasness and withness. They just want you to get this unity and identity plus relation and distinction. That is enough. That, that's a big task to handle in the first couple verses of a book. 
Then later on, he'll introduce the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes in, really comes on strong in chapter 14 and following. Um, okay, well, that's John 1. Much more could be said, obviously, but I want to rush us on to Matthew 28. If we just looked at the classic beginning of a gospel uh, in John 1, now we're looking at the classic ending of a gospel, Matthew 28. The whole story of Matthew happens, and the risen Jesus says to the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Well, um, I just want to do a little counting exercise here with you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's three, right? There's threeness going on in this verse, okay? Um, this is a, 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 if you put this verse in the context of all of Matthew, it is something of a surprise ending. Um, or it's the kind of ending that makes you think, you get all the way through the 28 chapters and you think you know what's going on and then Jesus drops this on you and you have to think, so that was kind of the point of everything you were just saying? Because this is sort of new language. The Father stated absolutely like that. Not my Father or our Father, but the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Matthew prepared you for it a little bit in chapter 11 where Jesus said, no one knows the Father but the Son and no one knows the Son but the Father. But here at the end, he wraps it up um, and restates it as part of the name of God that he wants his disciples to be baptized into. Well, there's threeness there. I kind of make a big deal out of this because when people say, do you believe in the Trinity? Do you think the Trinity is in the Bible? Often it's a fight over the T word, right? It, it's surprisingly easy to get hung up on the word. And I'm willing to say I'm after the doctrine or the meaning of the Trinity, that is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as one God. I don't really care about the word itself, but the word is really helpful and it's a, a great traditional word. And it's just Latin for threeness, right? Trinity is just a Latin way of talking about threeness. Um, triunity is a way of talking about three and oneness, but if someone says, do you believe in the Trinity? Well, one thing you could do is say, could you say that in English? Because Trinity, that sounds, like, that sounds like algebra or that sounds like Latin or Roman Catholic or something. I don't know what that is. Just like, ask me, do I believe in threeness? And then I look at Matthew 28 and say, I believe in threeness, look, one, two, three. Now, then we could fight about what you believe about threeness, right? Uh, you have to believe the right thing about threeness, but threeness is uncontroversial. In fact, one time I looked up the earliest occurrence of the word Trinity in English, and you get off into the Anglo-Saxon, you know, roots of this thing, and you come up with this guy. I, I, we have people who can say Anglo-Saxon words here in the audience. I'll say something like threeness. I have no idea if that's close, but it sounds weird, so it's got to be, I'm getting a thumbs up from the Anglo-Saxon guy. Thank you. <laughs> threeness. Partly I was excited, like, ooh, look, the earliest occurrence of the word Trinity. Then I was kind of disappointed. That's not Trinity, that's just threeness. Then I thought, wait, that is Trinity. That's all Trinity means. We get tricked by the fact that it sounds like a technical word. We're just talking about threeness, and it's kind of in the Bible, yeah? So when people ask me, is the word Trinity in the Bible? Um, my short answer is no, of course not. The concept is there, it's a later helpful label. But if I'm feeling a little bit puckish and say, I don't know, am I allowed to count? Right? <laughs> have I added anything to the word of God when I count? Because um, you have threeness going on here, right? You have the one name of the three somethings. Now this gets you into the question of what have you got three of? And of course, then the church, ha church has to sit down and do some head scratching and say, well, there's three, mm, can I just say there's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yeah, but could you give us a group noun for what there's three of? I'll say person, but don't go nuts with that or anything because it's not like there's three people. You ever notice we talk about three persons in the Trinity, but if I said three people in the Trinity, you'd go, that ain't right. Yeah. <laughs> and when we're talking about a group of us, we don't say, um, look how many persons came here. Now the fire marshal might, right? The fire marshal counts persons for some reason. Occupancy limited to 50 persons. But nobody else talks like that. Um, and when we talk about people here and persons there, we're signifying to each other in simple language that is not exactly the same thing but we gotta have some word for what there's three of or we're not gonna communicate at all. Um, so a simple approach to the Trinity is to say, if you ask of God, what is God? The answer will be God, Godness, you know, deitas, uh, Godhood. Um, but who is God? The answer will be uh, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. So in really short form, one what and three who's. Okay, triunity, as I say, is a special word we made up to describe just this strange reality. 
um, of, of who God is. Let me say, since this is a fantastic mission passage, go and make disciples in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinitarian theology goes with mission theology. It also does in the Gospel of John, where Jesus um, breathes on the disciples, says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, receive the Holy Spirit. You see the Trinity at work there, right? Jesus saying, the Father sent me, I send you, receive the Holy Spirit. It's pretty amazing how much the sending and the mission and the church's participation in the mission of the Son and Spirit is wrapped up with the revelation and the clear teaching of the doctrine of the Trinity. If I didn't have Matthew 28, I could probably teach the doctrine of the Trinity, but I'd rather not, because it's just that good. Speaking of so good, uh, John 1's absolutely mandatory. Matthew 28, you gotta have that. After that, I could pick a lot of things, so I just picked my current favorite, Ephesians 2.18. Through him, that is Christ, who um, Paul has just been talking about, Christ who came and preached peace to those who are far off, I think in this case the Gentiles, and to those who are near, um, I think in his case the, the Jews who believe in Jesus. Um, through him, Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. The point I want to make here is, again, how closely involved the triunity of God is with um, our salvation and with the gospel. Paul's talking here, what kind of language is he using? He's talking about uh, worship, right? Access is a worship word in, in the New Testament. Um, you can't just go to God, you need to have access to God. You need to get access to Him. And for the Jew and Gentile to both have access to God means that they have been brought into the presence of God through Christ who came and preached peace. Um, it's Jew and Gentile, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Um, uh, there's an overcoming here of racial and ethnic tensions, of, of traditional uh, differences, of, of uh, otherness and difference that could alienate and tear apart the Christian community. But Paul's saying um, that if we're all going to the same Father through the same Christ in the same spirit, then we are going to be unified and the great message of Ephesians, uh, of Christian unity, um, and especially of the unity of Jews and Gentiles that Paul's thinking about there, is all kind of bound up here with the message of the Trinity. I should also point out here that you've got um, the Father as the goal, that, oh, I was gonna make a point about that. Uh, Flannery O'Connor has this short story called Everything That Rises Must Converge. Everything that rises must converge. It only makes sense if everyone's rising to the same point, right? And so if you think you can go to God, but remain kind of separate but equal from all other Christians, then you're wrong. Everything that's going to God is going to the same Father through Christ in the same spirit. So there's unity built into this access to God that we've got. Um, what, what you get here, just a glimpse, you could say a lot more about this. I've written at least one book on this, that salvation and worship and fellowship are by and from and in and with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is all, uh, there's worship here. This is also prayer language. Uh, when Christians pray to God, we are praying to the Father because of the Son or in the name of the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit, whether we're thinking that thought or not, right? I'm not saying all Christian prayer has the form, uh, I pray to God the Father in the name of the Son. I'm saying that all Christian approach to God Christians know we're not approaching God on our own merits and our own name by our own power. So that even if you're talking to Jesus in prayer, you're not coming to him on your own, right? You're coming to him in the name of the Son and the power of the Spirit. So there's mediation built into the Christian notion of prayer. It's all Trinitarian, uh, whether you're thinking Trinitarian thoughts or not. Well, um, some key concepts that we've got here it, as we've uh, gone through some sections of scripture, I tried to point out to you some of the conceptual things that the church tradition, the tradition of theology will develop. Um, you get categories like identity and distinction. You get the co-eternity. He was in the beginning with God. You get threeness. There's sending. It's connected to the gospel. We could comb through a few other passages and kind of abstract out the conceptual goodies that are present there as we do solid exegesis of those passages. If you then assemble those goodies, you realize, oh yeah, this is a recognition of the triunity of God. Okay, last thing I wanna point out is um, uh, one brief reflection on, as you're carrying your Bible around, thinking good Trinitarian thoughts, uh, I hope that one of the things I've done here is uh, by sharing my personal obsession with the Trinity with you for about an hour, um, Heighten your senses 
so that next time you go through any passage of the Bible, you will see the Trinity there and either think, dang, that Sanders, he just got like Trinity all over my glasses and now I'm seeing it everywhere, right? <laughs> I, I hope that is the case. I hope this is kind of like um, taking a little guided walk with someone who really knows the neighborhood you're walking through and points things out. Doesn't point out everything, but points out uh, an element of everything so that from now on, your eyes are open to it. I'm confident in that because I'm robustly confident that the doctrine of the Trinity is revealed in Scripture and that if you are Bible readers and Bible studiers, I don't have to have you come over to my house and do a personal, private, read it the right way Trinity Bible study. It really is in there. You're going to run into it. But in, we make some mistakes sometimes when we think about how the doctrine of the Trinity is in Scripture. So the last thing I want to say is you could kind of go piece by piece through these logical elements of the doctrine of the Trinity and say, can I prove each one of these points? Every claim, every truth claim embedded in this little diagram. Can I prove that the Father is God? Yep, got some verses for that. Can I prove that the Father is not the Holy Spirit? Yep, so you work your way all around, do your proof text. That's one way of doing it. Notice two things about that though. I'm not saying don't do it. I've done it this way myself. Uh, I may yet do it this way again at some other point. I'm not making any promises. But a couple things that are left out. Think about that line that says the Father is not the Son. That is the strangest, most abstract thing I can think of to say about the Father and the Son, right? And I can't find a Bible verse about it because all the Bible verses I can find say the Father loves the Son, the Father sends the Son, the Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father, the Son loves the Father. So I have to take out all those great content-bearing verbs and replace them with is not. <laughs> I think, amen, warms my heart, the Father is not the Son, right? Like, it, it's a necessary logical abstraction, but if it doesn't leave you wanting to sing holy, 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 yeah, there's a reason for that. This is, a, this is kind of a teaching tool to help you not make some mistakes. Another way of saying that, the second point I wanted to make about this is there is a relation among the Father and the Son and the Spirit which this doesn't actually depict. It doesn't depict the love relationship. It doesn't show the way in which they are um, united to each other. It doesn't show that the Father begets the Son or that the Son is eternally from the Father. Um, so the classic doctrine of eternal generation, the eternal begetting of the Son, you could re restate it more easily as just the eternal sonness of the Son, that, that the Son has sonhood with regard to the Father who has fatherhood, and they stand in that relationship of, uh, what are the fancy words, paternity and filiation. Yeah? That, that there's that fromness relationship that's what they've got. That's why I normally teach the doctrine of the Trinity this way. One God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the red arrows indicate the way that the Son comes from the Father, the Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. The Spirit is fully God, but He's the Spirit of God. Um, so you have these eternal processions in the being of God. Here's the hard part, last big step I'll ask you to take. These relations of origin would be who God is even if the Father had never sent the Son to become incarnate or sent forth the Spirit to be poured out, right? Now, the whole gospel is that the Father did send to the Son and the Spirit, but even if he had not done that, God would still be Father, Son, and Spirit in these relations with the Son always coming from the Father within the life of God. So that then when the Son comes from the Father in the life of humanity, it's an extension of the eternal procession. And in technical Christian theological language, we call those missions, Missions was a piece of Trinitarian technical terminology before it was a description of something the church does. Yeah? So you could go one step further. Like I asked you to imagine what if Jesus had never come and the Spirit had never come. Imagine God had never created anything. Imagine there was just God. John Lennon says, imagine there's no heaven. That, you know, okay, that, that's easy in the modern world. Imagine there's no earth. Imagine there's nothing but God. If there's nothing but God, God's not lonely, God's not looking for a good time, wondering if anything exciting could happen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not sitting around going, oh, if only we had the pitter-patter of little feet around the drafty mansions of heaven. If only there was some life and vitality and good stuff going on. In the fullness of the eternal, perfect, blessed life of God, there is fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's, uh, it's, it's of itself. It would be there even if we weren't here. Now, um, that's kind of a long step to take. I just asked you to imagine everything away except God. 
So um, if you're back now, oh, we're back here. There is us, God did create things, we did fall, we need a redemption. The Father sent the Son and the Holy Spirit. The gospel is true and the gospel is grounded in the eternal triune being of God. That is my way of talking about the doctrine of the Trinity made known in scripture. This is the leading edge of what the great tradition of Christian theology has developed in a wonderfully rich way and helpful way down through the centuries. But it's crucial for us not to simply say, I believe it because Augustine believes it or grandma believed it and that settles it. It's really crucial for us to be intelligent Bible believers who can point to where in scripture God has made himself known as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. That's interesting. Well, I bet we're not going to do it. No, I'm joking. Um, talk about the indwelling of the Trinity. What impact that is that we become in Christ, in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Take it from there. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's one of the great blessings of the new covenant is the, that God is with us. Um, there are two ways of sort of expanding the notion of God being with us. One is to say that God the Son became incarnate, took human nature to himself, and is in that sense with us. And that's why the Gospel of Matthew ends, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, another way of thinking about God being with us is you could talk about the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh, right? That's another sense of God being with us. Actually, if you think about the ascension of Christ and the descent of the Holy Spirit, um, those are sort of two sides of one coin. You know, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit won't come until I go. Or the Gospel of John says, the Spirit was not given yet uh, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. The Son sit, sitting at the right hand of the Father as a human, right? It's not, I'm not talking about the Son always being with the Father as God. I'm talking about Him ascending into heaven and being seated at the right hand of God because he has completed the work of salvation and is bearing our humanity in the presence of God, that's really God with us. And the spirit being poured out on all flesh on the basis of the finished work of the atonement of Jesus Christ, that's really God with us. So I hope you hear the Trinitarian thing there, right? Um, that the son being with the father and sending the spirit from the father, that's the indwelling. Now a little more particular on the indwelling, I think it's most theologically correct and helpful to talk about the Holy Spirit as the um, personal agent of indwelling. In fact, I would even say, if you're in the habit of mainly saying Jesus lives in your heart, you don't have to stop doing that, but do add a little mental note that the main reason Jesus lives in your heart is because he is made present by the Holy Spirit, whose primary office it is to properly indwell. Yeah. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus will even say, my Father and I will come and dwell with you. So there's even a sense in which the Father is in you, um, at least according to Jesus, and he's generally reliable. <laughs> okay, very good. Next question. <laughs> if Jesus is God, why did he say, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, good. Um, maybe I could frame this by saying that what's happening on the cross um, is not simply a revelation of God. It is all, of course, it's God on the cross and, and um, God behind it. So there is a revelation of God going on there, but there's also a revelation of the depth of sin. So um, you go to the cross partly theologically to get your understanding of what humanity is at its farthest extent of fallenness um, and what sin is and what the cost of redemption is. What that enables you to do is uh, to look at what's happening between Christ and the Father on the cross and not have to say, what mystery of, of brokenness are we looking at here in God? Because I just submit to you that that is not a fruitful line of thought, that there is no brokenness um, inside of God. God did not come apart at that point. Um, what you're seeing there is the cost of salvation. Um, we think about being punished for sin uh, largely in terms of suffering being inflicted, and certainly suffering is inflicted on the cross, but we also think of it in terms of exile. And another way, biblically, of thinking about what's happening at the cross is Jesus going into exile, um, carrying our, our exile um, with him. So um, that's the main thing I wanna say about that. Just in terms of some guidelines, there's much more to be said here in a theology of the cross 
and relating the Trinity to it. But in terms of guidelines, I want to say what I think Tom McCall at Trinity Divinity School has said, well, you can't think of that cry of dereliction, uh, my God, why have you forsaken me? You can't think of it as a broken Trinity. If you think it's possible for the Son to be removed from the Trinity, to be somehow, for the fellowship of the triune God to be broken, and yet for there still to be a God, that's a warning sign. That means that without knowing it, you think default God is not the Trinity, because the Trinity part could be shut off, but you'd still have God. That's an indication that you haven't really thought the doctrine of the Trinity all the way into the fundamental character of who God is. So I go into that just saying, whatever that means, and there are many more things we could say about what that cry means. It's a, you know, all of our gospel and our relationship with God is caught up there. Whatever it means, it can't mean broken Trinity. It can't mean God came apart. It can't mean that the Father and the Son did not love each other or were not united. And I would also add to that the suggestion that, that, that Jesus is actually quoting a psalm. That's the first verse of the psalm. And if you'll read through the psalm, the whole psalm is in the heart of Jesus, including the redemption at the end of the psalm from the Father. So just for granted. And the, the middle, yeah, the, the, there's the descent half and then the ascent half of the psalm. And right in the middle, it's uh, in the midst of the congregation, I will see you, sing your praises. So it's a very rich Psalm 22 for messianic interpretation. Okay, you said Father sent Spirit and Son. Can you comment then on the filioque controversy where Son and Father send Spirit? How much time you got? <laughs> um, yeah, so my diagrams are habitually not taking a position on the filioque question. The filioque question has to do uh, with the procession of the Holy Spirit. Where does the Holy Spirit come from? Not in the history of salvation. That's a different question. Who sent the Holy Spirit or how did the Holy Spirit get poured out? This is before that. Again, if you think about just the Trinity in itself, not with reference to the sending of the Spirit, but the eternal coming of the Spirit from God in the life of God, there are two views. One is the text of the original Nicene Creed, the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed of 381, which we call the Nicene Creed because nobody wants to say the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed of 381 in public, like I just did. Um, the original text says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who is worshiped and glorified together with the Father and the Son, who proceeds from the Father. That's what it says. Um, at some point in the next century or two, Western people reciting the creed began to say out loud what they'd apparently been thinking all along, which was, I believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and from the Son, ut filioque, and also from the Son. Um, well, when Eastern theologies and Western theologies were trying to have a worship meeting together and they realized they were saying different things, it's like when you're a forgive us our sins person and you're in a forgive us our trespasses church, right? <laughs> like you're all having a great time praying the Lord's Prayer together and someone's talking too much, right? And you're trying to figure out what's going on there. Where'd you get that? I think some Christians were kind of praising the Trinity together and realized, what did you just say? From the Father and from the Son? Because I meant from the Father only. Well, this is the principal dogmatic, uh, this is the principal doctrinal difference between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. And I think it more or less is to this day. Um, I, the big lingering question here, before I move on without answering every possible question about the filioque, uh, is um, how much does it matter? Um, is it in fact a reason for uh, disruption of fellowship between Eastern and Western churches? I tend to look at the difference between Eastern and Western churches more as it is hard to keep a civilization together around the Mediterranean after the fall of Rome. They just kind of grew apart and then found something to fight over. But that's a, that is a, that is an involved question. In the spirit of continuing with these easy ones, <laughs> I'm going to do that one in a minute. <laughs> um, Let's do this one first. What is the work of God the Father in the crucifixion? I.e., do you affirm substitutionary atonement's claim that Jesus is the substitute for us when God wanted to exercise his wrath because of sin? You said the Trinity did not break during this crucifixion. What do you mean by this? Also, hi from a Tory chum. <laughs> okay. Hello, Tory chum. Um, the work of the Father in the crucifixion, uh, let me briefly say that the question of the work of the Father is, um, 
It's a, it's a great question, and it's the actual, probably most neglected question in Trinitarian theology. You know, we tend to say, oh, the Holy Spirit, the neglected person of the Trinity, you'd be guilty of ignoring the work of the Spirit. Um, I actually think it's concentrated attention on the person of God the Father that is most missing in a lot of kind of our operative theologies. Uh, we're pretty, it's pretty tempting to, when you think about God the Father, to just think about God in general, um, or, or even, uh, you know, when I'm worshiping in various congregations, I'll sometimes hear people say things like, um, Jesus so loved the world. They won't quite say that he sent his only son, right? <laughs> um, but, but they will attribute to the Son of God things that are pretty clearly biblically attributed to the Father. In fact, the Puritan John Owen did a Bible study of a communion with God the Father in particular, and he found two things especially correlated with the work of the Father in the New Testament. One is election, the, the choosing. Uh, the choosing of believers is mainly said to be by the Father. Um, only a couple of times is that attributed to the Son. But the second one is kind of the breakthrough, love. The love of God is primarily attributed to God the Father in the New Testament. It's a short little Bible study, but I've worked with students where this has just blown their mind. Because if you ask them, what do you think of when you think of God the Father? They do various forms of projection or motivated non-projection of their own understanding of fatherhood, right? And they'll say things like, oh, stern and justice and wrath, and that's, that's God the Father. And they'll say, okay, but biblically, if you just do a simple word study of what words are associated with the concept of father, God the Father in the New Testament, it's love. That's a real paradigm shifter, right? And I just, I wanted to get that out there before we talk about the work of God the Father on the cross. Um, I do affirm um, substitutionary punishment um, as what's happening on the cross. And there's, there's something going on in the, in the unified work of the Trinity on the cross in which the Son is, of course, the one in his personal humanity, his appropriated human nature, which is ours, but he has taken to himself, he is taking the punishment for sin. Um, and in that role, the Father, who is not incarnate and taking the punishment, um, is, is on the side of the justice and ra righteousness and even wrath of God. The thing you don't want to do is think that in themselves, as father and son, the father's got the wrath and the son's got the mercy, right? That's when you've really accidentally taken apart the Trinity. Um, the son of God is just as holy as the father and just as mad about sin as we will see when the book of Revelation is all rolled out, right? People aren't saying, hide me from the wrath of the mean father. They're actually crying out, hide me from the wrath of the lamb, right? The son is holy, righteous, wrathful, um, all the attributes of God that you might want to sort of, that you might be tempted to sort of dump on God the father to pool your toxic assets. I've got good news and bad news for you. Those also all belong to the son of God. Yeah. So that what's going on on the cross is much more a unified act. Um, the son is on the receiving end because he has appropriated human nature to himself and is working out that drama. Again, it's the same thing. There's, there can be a bad habit of getting sort of, of looking to the cross and saying, there I see the revelation of who God is. That's only part of what you're seeing on the cross. I would be more likely to point to the resurrection and ascension of Christ and say, there you see the revelation of who God is and he's taking us with him, right? You get something different, you get more, and something more complex on the cross. Okay, I've got time, perhaps, for a couple of lightning round questions. Just not like those last two. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. What is the meaning of life? No. Um, <laughs> but, but, last digit of pi. But before we do, uh, the, the obsessive compulsive part of my nature needs to make sure that somewhere within this lecture we correct the poor Greek knowledge of that incredible artisan theologian of the 11th century yeah. where he's got Jesus recoiling, don't touch me because I haven't yet ascended to my father. If he'd been reading his Greek and he saw the verb haptu, he would have known it was in the present tense, <laughs> an imperative, but passive. And it doesn't mean don't touch me like there's something goofy going on with my body because I haven't gone up. It means don't st stop clinging to me. Stop hugging me. You know, I hadn't left yet. I'm still here. You don't have to keep embracing me. It's that type. That's one of the most misunderstood passages still today. 
because people aren't reading it out of their Greek. It wasn't, I've got some fuzzy body that's, that's <laughs> going to like explode if you touch me or you'll explode. Not at all. It's, 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 it was a sweet, endearing, hey, hang on, let go. You don't have to squeeze so tight. I hadn't gone yet. I'm right here, okay? Just yeah, for I, grins. You're right. Albertus was reading Latin, noli me tangere. Exactly. And in the Latin, you've missed it. But if he had been reading the Greek, he'd have gotten hap to and he'd have nailed it, which is unusual because it was enamel. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is the ro ho role of the Holy Spirit once we're in heaven? I look forward to discussing that with you in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Related question. If the Holy Spirit is uh, God, yeah. which we believe, um, explain uh, within the framework of the Trinity uh, how he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, Romans 8. Yeah, that's, that's good. And, and let me do the two-handed thing immediately and say that in Romans 8, we have Christ interceding with, for us, right? And then in the same chapter, we have the Holy Spirit interceding for us. I sometimes think, you know, you know where it says we don't know how to pray as we ought? Uh, that's a really important verse in my prayer life. It's not my life verse or anything, but, uh, <laughs> but when I'm experiencing the reality of not knowing how to pray as we ought, I'm, in, I'm encouraged that there are apparently two intercessors. God apparently recognized that I was so incompetent at this that he appointed someone to dial on this end and someone to pick up on the other end. Um, <laughs> so the, <laughs> there are these two kinds of intercession going on. On the particular question of what it means for the Spirit to, um, uh, to, to intercede for us with groanings too deep for words, um, th there's an interesting debate about whether that means I say something incoherent and the Spirit kind of fixes it yeah. Or whether I say something kind of shallow and the Spirit adds to it the depth of groaning. Because um, it seems more literally that it's not that I say something dumb and the Spirit says something more intelligent. It seems more like I say something and the Spirit's intercession is a matter of groaning. And the Spirit's also correlated with groaning uh, in terms of our longing for redemption. Right? Not just, that'll be great, I wish that would happen, but oh, it's killing me, when will that happen? Um, what are the pastoral implications of the Trinity. Uh, why should we speak Trinitarian words about God? I mean, th this is not uh, an ad for the book which is available here at a great price. Uh, <laughs> um, but but I, I think the pastoral implications are, are um, securing the knowledge of God with a kind of a, a reality and a thickness um, that it's easy for us to lose sight of or skip over. Um, it's really tempting when you study the doctrine of the Trinity a lot and then get to speak in churches where no one else has had the leisure to study it that much, to kind of come in and say, I bring you words of truth and it will blow your mind. And you've probably never heard this before, but let me write this on your blank slates of a mind. Um, I really, I, I, I thought that teaching it that way would further alienate people who were kind of not as excited as I thought they should be about the doctrine of the Trinity. So what I wanted to do was consistently say, come on, you already know this. Here's an invitation. I want to teach the doctrine of the Trinity as an invitation to know this better, right? To, to know it more deeply, to recognize, to see the touch points and say, you know, I, I did know that, that the main point of the Bible is the Father, sent the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and I kind of did know that that's why Christians believe that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because we're, we're not just saying, I got my gospel thing, and on the other hand, I got this triangle diagram, which is difficult to think about. That's a false understanding. It's a false self-understanding. In fact, you're already soaking in a Trinitarian reality as a Christian. Um, and so what I think the pastoral implications of speaking well of the Trinity the implication should be a deepening and a solidity. I have a chapter in there on assurance of salvation, um, which is not a traditional way of going at it, but it's a, uh, a deepening kind of way of going at it, to go further into what you've already got. Fantastic. Would you join me in thanking Professor Fred Sanders again?